Don't tell him I took the camera, but I feel like I need to show you this. I think I know what's inside this box, believe it or not. He's been telling me about this workshop he wants to start once COVID's over to show people how to repair old books. And he said he ordered a bunch of them from America, just as practice material. And I think this is it. I was looking for him in the house here. I couldn't find it. I wanted to record his reaction. I think he's, yeah, where you think he is, in the book man script. So I'm going to see. Let's go. Papa. Yeah, he usually lives, he leaves the cat in charge when he's not here. People forget about her because she's such a slut. That's not him. Nice. Oh, hi. Got there. a box. Wow, it just arrived. Yep. Let's see what it is. I think I know. I thought I knew too. Yep. Aha. Uh -huh. So these are all books that I've ordered from America as practice materials for my planned bookbinding course. If it happens this summer or next summer, we'll see. But, uh, oh, well, as you're here, um, I'm just about to start repairing a first edition of the Pickwick Papers. Um, so I've got all the materials I need here, and let me show you what I've got. Clearly, I've got a first edition of the Pickwick Papers, dated 1837 in Roman numerals. And here are the boards, the original boards for the book. I'll talk about these um, in detail a bit later. A bit of the spine that's remaining. And this is the cloth that I'm going to repair it with, which I have salvaged from a German grammar book from 1838. So I needed specifically this cloth and I managed to uh, remove the book cloth from this wrecked copy. And here are the things that I'm gonna be using for my repair. So what do we got? It's like Kim's game. Craft paper, mull, craft knife, scissors, eraser, um, resist tape, glue, book cloth cleaner, brush and water and a toothbrush and a bone folder. So these are my materials and I'm about to get on with the job. But you've tracked me down to the bindery and have a look around. So this is another room that I created during the lockdown last year. This was entirely full of boxes and boxes and boxes of books. 200 boxes of books which I brought over from England in 2017 and uh, during the lockdown I emptied them out and uh, created this bindery and over in the uh, the other end of the room is the Victorian periodical section so I've got a set there of uh, Blackwoods magazine, Cornhill magazine, Dublin University magazine, The Strand, The Windsor etc etc and on the far wall those are all books awaiting repair so I'm very unlikely to run out of books to repair because I've got hundreds and hundreds waiting and further boxes still to go but anyway the job in hand today is repairing a first edition of the Pickwick Papers okay the first thing I'm going to do is prepare the mull and the craft paper for putting a new spine on the book and uh, so I'll glue those and then the next stage will be dealing with the covers but let me go on with this. While one of me is physically engaged in this fiddly and highly accelerated manual work another me can fill you in on various background details starting with the restoration process. I bought this copy of Pickwick several years ago as a wreck which thankfully no one had previously attempted to repair I've already prepared the spine of the text block by carefully removing all the old lining and crystallised glue. I'm using reversible PVA and applying it with a paintbrush. Here we are, new mull and craft paper backing to the book. We'll leave that to dry off for a little while and now we'll get on to dealing with the covers of the book. This is very interesting. So these are the original covers for Pickwick in boards. 
When Pickwick was first issued, it came out in 20 monthly parts, in fact 19 plus a double issue, um, but 20 parts. Dickens's first novel and his first great success, the novel which made his name. Um, the publishers then issued it in cloth. Um, you could buy a cloth binding for the parts, but most people had their parts bound up in leather. And in the 19th century, leather was the most, or well, the early 19th century, leather was the most common way of binding up books. But book cloth was introduced in the 1820s, the late 1820s is when it started to become popular. But it was still pretty much in its infancy in the 1830s. According to Smith, Walter Smith, who's the bibliographer of Dickens's first editions in original cloth, um, this binding doesn't exist. So um, what he describes is a much plainer binding, and I've got bits of the spine here. You can see there's a bit of the spine there, and here's a major part of the spine, which says the Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. Now, according to um, Smith, we shouldn't have this by Charles Dickens on the spine, just the Pickwick Papers, and there shouldn't be this elaborate blind stamping to the boards. But this is the original cloth, and so what we're dealing with is a variant binding, as far as I know previously unrecorded, and clearly worth preserving because this is a great rarity. Right, I'm going to show you the job I've got to do now, which is going to take quite some time this is the remains of the spine, which I've already stripped back so that we're as near as possible to how it's going to be when we use it. And I've got to create a spine that incorporates the remaining original elements. I don't like throwing away anything from an original binding. So this is my philosophy of book restoration that I like to use every possible vestige of cloth um, that still remains and to use as near as possible the same material for repairing it. This is a very fine diaper cloth. Diaper means a sort of diamond pattern, very fine grain in the cloth. You probably won't be able to see it but um, the cloth's also embossed, this is known as blind stamping. This was the um, traditional way of decorating uh, the covers before illustration started to be used on book covers. But this is the early days of cloth covers. And basically you've just got the title and the author and some blind stamping on the covers. You can see that the cloth cover, sorry, the cloth colour has changed quite greatly from the, um, it's meant to be, um, purple or slate grey but it's gone brownish on the spine. That's just what happens. So I've got to uh, cut and create pieces of cloth to fit in here to restore the spine. Let's see how we get on. Turning our attention now to the origin of this famous book. In early 1836 Charles Dickens was completely unknown, at least under his own name, but during that year he published his first book, a collection of essays and short fiction which had originally appeared in a variety of journals, using the pseudonym that featured in the title, Sketches by Boz. It was on the strength of the modest popularity of that work that the recently established publishing firm of Chapman and Hall contacted the 24-year-old Dickens, inviting him to write some copy as textual accompaniment to a planned series of sporting prints that were to be produced by a well-known artist, Robert Seymour. A group of gentlemen, who were to have been members of the Nimrod Club, changed by Dickens to the Pickwick Club, were supposed to take a leisurely tour around England, hunting, shooting and fishing, and to get into a number of scrapes and comic escapades. Dickens admitted that he knew nothing of country sports, but offered to have a go. The book was projected for issue in monthly parts and it rapidly caught on with the public, who immediately took to Boz's motley crew of humorous characters and lively writing style. Seymour, the artist, felt that his contributions weren't receiving the attention they deserved 
and after only two monthly issues, he abruptly and permanently ceased his involvement in the partnership by blowing his brains out. It was decided to continue the serialisation using another artist, Robert Buss, but in this arrangement, Dickens was by now already the senior partner. Buss produced just two published plates before being sacked, but his connection to Dickens didn't end there. Shortly after Dickens' death in 1870, he began work on the unfinished watercolour known as Dickens' Dream, which features in the opening credits to all my videos. So, yet another artist had to be found, and the final, felicitous choice was Hablet Brown, whose work blended perfectly in tone with Dickens' writing, and their collaboration on Pickwick as Boz and Fizz marked the beginning of a hugely successful partnership that lasted well over 20 years, only ending with The Tale of Two Cities in 1859. So the first edition of Pickwick featured illustrations by three different artists, but the plates by bus were dropped and replaced by new illustrations from the pen of Fizz, making the bibliography of this book enormously complex. I better take a break here, as I think the craftsman is about to speak. And there we have the parts of the spine glued onto the new old backing. I've got to join the rear board to the spine and the front board. That's going to take a while, Well, let's go for it. What are the essential ingredients for book restoration? Clearly you need the right materials, a certain amount of knowledge and skill, and a good eye, but above all you need endless patience and meticulous attention to detail. You can see here it's come away a little bit from the board. So just I've already mentioned that this book resulted from the collaboration between the author and several artists, one after another, and it only came about at the instigation of the publishers, Chapman and Hall, who started out as booksellers before turning their attention to book publication. But they were far from the only parties involved in the production of this work, as the text was printed by the firm of Bradbury and Evans, who themselves became Dickens's publishers in the mid-1840s, and with whom he remained until 1858. The illustrations had to be engraved before they could be printed separately and on much stiffer paper or card. And once the text and illustrations were ready, they had to be bound up, that aspect of the production being given over to another set of artisans. Binding was a multi-stage process, starting with the folding of the printed sheets to make what were usually 16-page sections. A monthly part of Pickwick comprised two such sections, and if you've ever wondered why Dickens' long novels are of roughly uniform length, it's because he had to write 20 32-page parts which, including the preliminary material, came to a total of 640 pages. OK, there we have the case almost done. So I've uh, reattached the uh, remnants of the spine to the front cover and to the rear cover. The glue's still drying and uh, I'll tidy it up as I go along because little bits of the cloth keep lifting and I uh, have to keep patting them down and uh, adding a bit of glue here and there. Basically uh, that's done. I'm going to put a new lining in the spine as well. I open it up carefully because it's still work in progress. So here's the case and here's the text block. And you can see that what I've got to do next is to attach the mull to the boards. But I'm going to put a new lining in here to reinforce this. Anyway, once the sheets were folded into sections, they had to be sewn internally so that when the edges were cut, the pages wouldn't fall apart, and sewn to the neighbouring sections so that the book would remain intact. Let's not forget that in the 1830s all of these tasks were performed manually and that book sewing was largely undertaken by women and girls as piecework on very meagre wages. After the text block was ready, then the illustrations were tipped in by hand and very often the publishers included a page of instructions to the binders indicating where the plate should be inserted. A separate area of the binders work was the construction of the case the part that I'm now restoring. Straw boards were cut to size and over these the cloth was pasted, with scraps of waste paper and card being used for the spine lining. 
Once that stage was complete, the book blocks had to be glued to the cases and the whole job secured and made neat with end papers, pale yellow ones in this instance. All of that binding work is known as forwarding, to be completed by finishing, which was the decoration of the covers. In the case of Pickwick, that was the blind stamping or embossing of the decorative designs and rules under pressure and the lettering on the spine using gold leaf. When you consider the amount of labour that went into the production of a book in the 1830s, it's not surprising that they were still, for the most part, luxury items. It was only thanks to increasing mechanisation in paper production and printing technology that the cost of books came down dramatically during the century. A bound copy of Pickwick, such as the one I'm now restoring, would have cost 21 shillings in 1837. But just 30 years later, it could be purchased in the Charles Dickens edition for three shillings and sixpence. So these are the original um, pale yellow coated end papers, quite common in the early to mid 19th century. And uh, clearly I'm retaining these, but as the mull shows, I've got to cover it. And so what am I going to use? end papers salvaged from the very same manual for German dated 1838 and here we are these are the original boards and here's the yellow end paper I can't use this one because it's got an inscription on it but the rear one I can just remove neatly Not exactly the same shade of pale yellow, but it's close enough. I'm going to use the next minute and a half to put in a good word for book cloth. It may never have occurred to you that without book cloth, the knowledge revolution that took place in the 19th century would be hard to imagine. As my artisan self has already said, book cloth, which was a British invention, made its debut in the 1820s, when Dickens was already in his teens. Prior to that, the only materials available for the secure binding of books were leather and vellum, both animal products. Anyone who's attempted to bind in either of those materials will know just how difficult they are to work with if you want to achieve technically sound and aesthetically pleasing results. One of the first great advances of the Industrial Revolution was the mechanisation of weaving, enabling vast quantities of cotton cloth to be produced in the mill towns of Yorkshire and Lancashire. Once it was realised that stiffening certain cloths with size, a form of starch, made them impervious to book paste, the path was open for the mass production of lighter weight and uniformly bound cheaper books for the masses. Initially, the cloth colours available were rather drab greens and browns, and the cloths themselves thin and brittle. Quite rapidly, however, an enormous range of cloth styles, weights, colours and designs became available and England was soon exporting its revolutionary book cloth around the world. For this job, I've used cloth of an identical design and very similar colour salvaged from another book published just a year later in 1838. Without those precious scraps of cloth, I wouldn't have been able to undertake this repair as cloth of this colour and design hasn't been manufactured for well over 150 years and is totally unobtainable from any other source. Ah, nearly finished. And there we have it, the Pickwick Papers restored in its case, end papers preserved using remnants of end papers also over 180 years old, cloth over 180 years old, neatly recased and it'll just dry out now. Give it a little brush, make sure everything's spick and span. Oh, dust coming off there. Give it a good thump. There we are. The 
Pickwick Papers, 1837, restored. One last thing I'm going to do with it, give it a clean with Bacchus book cloth cleaner. Mmm, yummy. Not everyone's favourite, but I'm used to the smell. So, Dickens's first novel, and the book with which his name was principally associated throughout the 19th century. It's hard for us to imagine the stir this book created, but it was the right book at the right time, and Janus-like looked both ways. It ushered in the Victorian age, appearing in print just as the teenage queen ascended the throne. The novel's serialised parts, incidentally a mode of book production and consumption that Dickens made peculiarly his own, were rushed overland to every corner of the country thanks to the revolutionary railway network. And yet, ironically, the world that Pickwick depicts, somewhat elegiacly one feels, is the time just before the advent of the railways. An England of turnpikes and stagecoaches. A world that the Victorian age would sweep away in its rush towards modernity. That'll dry out somewhat paler, but it's more uniform now in appearance, and it'll remain rather more uniform than it was. Well, that's it. First edition of Pickwick Papers in original cloth. Restored, not to its pristine glory. Impossible. But it's, it's a working volume, and it's a rarity. A first edition of Pickwick is far from the only book that I've repaired in the past few years. This entire wall of books by Dickens's contemporaries, the multiple lifetime editions of Dickens's works, and on the other side, further editions of Dickens's works, plus all his contributions to periodicals, Bentley's Household Words, All the Year Round, all of these I've restored, repaired, or at the very least cleaned and tweaked over the past couple of years. And here it is, a restored copy of the first edition of Pickwick Papers in the original cloth, restored using materials from the 1830s. And it's about to take its place on the shelves of Dickens and Company. If you like what you've seen and you fancy trying your hand at book restoration, I'm planning on organising a residential bookbinding workshop here in Seged, southern Hungary, in the summer, circumstances permitting. If you fancy joining me and enjoying the facilities of Dickens and Company, The Bookman's Crib and learning all about book restoration, then sign up below. Just an expression of interest if you fancy learning how to do bookbinding. See you again. Cover them with tar. <laughs>